Hey, Howard here at 82 Maple. And what better thing to be doing on a snowy January day in Langley, BC, than winding up the old Alaska chainsaw. It just is somehow fitting with the snow, isn't it? And so I cut a slab yesterday and this is it here. We're just gonna call it old ugly because I quite intentionally let it sit out all summer long. It looks weather worn and beaten up, but boy, the other side is just beautiful and that'll be uh, a, a subject for another video. It is just spectacular grain on the other side. And so here we are cutting the next slab and it's going to turn out equally well. We're at about 40 inches here. Uh, the narrowest spot is about 27 inches. It's going to be fabulous. You know, one really has to do this on a regular basis to stay in tune, just like with anything else. Yesterday, I cut a whole slab, didn't wedge it once. So uh, at the end of the day, it was just kind of like, what are you thinking, Howard? You got to wedge this thing as we're going down. So we'll wind it up and we'll carry on. Boy, this thing just gobbles a ton of fuel uh, while while cutting this. And uh, I was down half a tank already. Well, looked like half a tank, probably only a third, but I should be good through to the end here. Okay, Howard here at 82 Maple again, and that's what we do with an Alaskan chainsaw. So let's start at the very beginning. Hey, this is quite a power head. You know, I've got uh, two other gas powered uh, still chainsaws around. I've mentioned in previous videos that still has been my go-to ever since my dad came home with a really terrific little still, about a 20 inch bar on it probably when I was 13 or 14 years old. And uh, from then on, uh, it's been still. And we're here to talk about an Alaska chainsaw. So this is what comes from our friends at Grandberg. Grandberg is essentially the inventor of the Alaska chainsaw mill. And you can go to their site. I've got a link down below to it and the story's all there, but it's an amazing, amazing story. Uh, I grew up in British Columbia and all through Northern BC. It's just routine in uh, resource exploration that they drop a guy off, uh, it comes down a line off of a helicopter with a pack sack, a couple days provisions, a chainsaw, and one of these little guys uh, broken down uh, hanging off the pack sack and uh, with nothing more than that drop some trees build a helicopter pad and we're in the exploration business so these serve another purpose I've got some really sweet uh, two three four inch slabs of wood around that uh, I've cut using the Alaska chainsaw mill. Now I have my trusty little Norwood, of course, and, um, 
uh, it serves me very, very well in that uh, I can cut logs up to 28, 29 inches, something like that. But uh, I've got some logs out on the yard there that are, oh, 40 inches plus, a little bark on them, 44 inches. That's where this bad boy comes in. So I naively thought that I could use one of my uh, recent still chainsaw purchases to run a ripping chain, and I'll get into that in a minute, and throw it on the Alaska chainsaw mill and I would be in business. One quick call to the dealer, that wasn't going to happen. And so that's where this guy came in. I think this one pumps probably eight or nine horsepower, something like that. And uh, uh, warning, you know, I'm just gonna take this right from the ground up because I'm a complete novice around this. So if you're a veteran, you can just burst out laughing and leave at any time and I'll totally forgive you. But uh, there's a little compression release. This was my first chainsaw with a compression release button. And that's critical when it comes to starting this. Uh, I can crank this now with relative ease. Once this fires, the compression release button releases. And so here's to my first starting attempt with this. Choke it, still standard, throw the button down, uh, set it, give this a crank, give it a crank, give it a crank, it fires. Yes, we have fire in the hold. That's exactly what we want. And uh, so now, just take it up out of the choke position or it automatically pops up. And I go to give it my next crank. Well, I tell you, my shoulder, my arm nearly departed my shoulder at that point because that firing had released this little compression release button and I was now on full compression. And if you ever walked into a door that you thought was going to swing open, but it didn't, and you walked in arm extended, well, yeah, it was kind of the reverse of that. And so lesson learned every time now, I make sure and keep an eye on that little guy. So moving on up from, from the ground up, the reason I needed the big cutting head is on anything smaller, the engine might have turned, but I would have cooked the clutch within a cut or two. So it had to be this big boy with the big clutch, the big power to turn. Uh, I think I've got a 52 inch bar on this. Got the bar from Granberg, got the saw from my friendly still dealer, took bar, took saw, got a ripping chain here from Granberg. Can we make this whole thing up and set it up for me right the first time around? They oblige and off we went. So I'm gonna take a couple of minutes now and assemble this into Alaska Chainsaw Mill. But just before I do that, I'm going to tell you what went wrong. So if we remove this little housing, and I really love what still is done with this. I used to drop these nuts into the mud, etc. Impossible to do so now. They've mounted them in there so that that just stays. Love it. Um, we have this little wheel in here that drives the chain. This one happens to be brand new. And you know what? I'm just noticing an issue here that I'm going to have to adjust before I do anything with this. And you're probably seeing it too. I don't think that the tune-up shop that I just visited uh, fired this thing up before it left. And this is, I guess, one of the reasons for doing the video. So this is brand new. It says 404-7. That means I'm running a, this is designed for a 404 chain. I just got some brand new Oregon 404 chain. And so we're gonna make this happen. The issue was, I went through two $150 chains. Yes, a 52 inch ripping saw chain sets you back in Canada between $125 and $150. And the chain would get so tight, I could hardly extract it from the bar, let alone run it. And 
I was totally perplexed. What in the world is going on? Which is why this chainsaw went into a repair shop for a visit. Well, I was running this guy here and you can't see it probably, but this is the drive wheel for a 3 8 chain. I was running 404 chain on a 3 8 drive wheel. What that did is it splayed out these drive cogs until they got so tight they wouldn't progress down the chain. I couldn't figure out what was doing it. Not an experienced chainsaw guy. When you mismatch the chain with the drive cog, you're in deep trouble. I'm actually shocked I didn't burn out an incredibly expensive little clutch. So lesson learned. Now, this is not going to function like this. So I'm just gonna reach down here for my trusty chainsaw tool, back this guy out, and my chain is just singing tight here. So I'm not gonna take up your time on this video. What I'm going to do is roll this, go down here to the far end. I've got tons of adjustment room down here. Look at what I've got in here. All I have to do is back off these set nuts. So this is the little handle that you need if you're going to be running an Alaska chainsaw mill. There's a trick of getting around and away from that handle. We'll talk about that a little later on, but this is how I started. And we'll back this off and get some space up here because if I don't get space up here, uh, I'm going to cook this and get enough heat into it that if the bar isn't useless, certainly that clog, the cog and the clutch are going to heat up unbelievably. So we're going to take a little break now. Uh, I'm going to make the necessary adjustments. Again, I'm not going to open it up after I make the adjustments, but I will make sure that there's at least three sixteenths of an inch in here. I've got lots of room down at the far end. I can tighten this up to where I've got a good eighth of an inch or three sixteenths down here. And then I'm going to set it up in Alaska chainsaw mill format. Hey, before we do that, a couple of other things. This is a typical grinding angles chart and you can get them anywhere. Bottom line, it says that ripping chain, we should run at a 50 degree uh, grinding cut and a 10 degree uh, sideways angle. So as we look at a tooth, 50 degrees in this way for the wheel and a 10 degree tilt, depending on which side of the chain that we're sharpening. My friends, from the Oregon, local Oregon chain dealer said, no way, at least not for an Oregon ripping chain. For an Oregon ripping chain, we wanna go 70 degrees and one degree this way or the other. That's the way this chain has been sharpened. The next cut you see me make is going to be with a 70 degree, one degree chain. There's something else that's different about this. So this is an Oregon ripping chain and we have alternating teeth just like we would on a traditional chainsaw. And the back, I've got a replacement chain here and it says, warning, risk of serious personal injury to users and bystanders. The usual thing they do on chainsaw chain. But hey, this goes way deeper. This is a 27R. 27R is classified as a ripping chain. And so the warning goes on. This saw chain is made with aggressive cutters for use in mechanical processing applications only. It can cause high kickback or other expected, unexpected reactions in handheld equipment. High chain speeds present the risk of thrown pieces in the event of breakage and chain der derailment, etc., etc. This is a ripping chain warning. And so I will never use this chain in a traditional handheld application. It will only be used inside the Alaska chainsaw apparatus. We're going to take a walk here to the other room.
So this is where the chain treatments begin. You can see I've got a couple of other saws here that are needing some uh, chain sharpening. Over here I've got my, uh, we're looking at the back side of my little Oregon uh, branded uh, chain sharpener. And so that's what we use around here for keeping chain sharp. But uh, my first inclination again was to put this little still MS290. I don't even know what the horsepower is on it, but it's more than adequate for that 20 or 22 inch bar I've got on it. I think it's a 20 inch. Uh, but uh, it would have burnt out the clutch had I tried to put it into an Alaska chainsaw mill application. So uh, was a great call uh, to make to the dealer to find that out. What I do here is um, after I've sharpened the chain, I run it through this little oil bath. And I, it's very simple. I just got it strung up here on, on a little apparatus in my shop and just roll it around. This happens to be a chain that is now so badly damaged that I can't run it. You're not going to be able to see it very well. You see the shiny parts there. But if I feel it this way, there's actually a flange sticking out that I probably would need a hammer to try and jam this back into the chainsaw uh, bar. And that's the result of wrong drive cog on the right chain or vice versa. It's a 3 8 drive cog on a 404 chain. That's a predictable result. Would have never occurred to me given that the install had been done by a qualified dealer. There's nothing like staying on top of the equipment, staying on top of your own personal knowledge base. Hey, it's your saw, it's my, your chain. Nobody's going to reimburse me for $250 chains, I can tell you that that's on me so uh, uh, we can do it the other thing I want to point out here is this is a ripping chain from Granberg so you notice a very traditional tooth here then we go to a clipped tooth clipped tooth traditional tooth traditional tooth clipped tooth see notice the narrowness there between my fingernails Notice the regular size there, clipped tooth, regular tooth. Now I'm going to try Oregon's Finest, the recommendation that they make for an Alaska chainsaw mill. If I had a complaint about the chain and the chainsaw milling process, it seemed to me that it was taking a bit more time to cut the length of the log than I would have anticipated, maybe that's normal. We're going to see if that new chain, properly installed, does the trick. See you outside in a few minutes. Okay, so here we are. And my little Norwood HD36, as amazing as it is, is good for about a 29 inch log cut. Hey, what are we looking at here, bark to bark? We're looking at 40 inches, maybe 41. Not gonna fit through the sawmill. And what a sweet piece, because even after the bark falls off, let's go inside here. We have a 35 inch tabletop. That's crazy. And even if we go down to the thin end of the log, uh, what do we got? 30 inches? That's not bad. We could trim a straight edge off one side and still have a 30 inch wide tabletop with a live edge. It doesn't get any better than that. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, what have we got for length here? We have, man, we're over nine feet. You can see the pretty big family around that. Uh, one of my boys wants one of these slabs and he says, uh, yeah, we can go 80, 84 inches, something like that. So at that, we're still, um, yeah, we're 30 inches. So we're all good. So here's the ladder. And what I do, and basically, here's everything you need to do this job. Uh, I secure the ladder throw a couple of little screws
screws in just to secure it down. Couple at that end, couple at this end. What is this all about? Well, this is the amazing Grandberg winch. As simple as it seems, it's a critical piece of equipment. So I have the very good fortune of having friends and relatives in British Columbia's forest industry. And brother-in-law Jerry uh, said to me, you know, even if you're holding on to the chainsaw with just one hand, a little bit of deflection is going to take it up, down, up, down, and is going to result in an uneven cut. So the real professionals that use these Grandberg Alaska chainsaw mills will literally take and just put a rubber band or a hose clamp around this. I've not advanced to that stage yet, so you're going to see my hand on it. But what this winch does is it moves the saw down the log with any deflection. When I started out, the reason I got this particular end for the saw was that one of my boys would take this handle, I would take that side, and we would advance the saw down the log. But every time we came to finish the slab out, there were waves because either he had put a little unintentional torque on this one way or the other, I had put some unintentional torque on that side one way or the other. So now what I try and do is keep a finger on this and just keep moving the winch to take it down the log. So what we require, two screws here, two screws down here, a couple of screws in the end of this, adjust this so it basically is at the same height as we're coming down the log there. So this has a very nifty little adjustment right here and I can raise or lower. I've got room to get the saw out of the cut before coming into this. Hey, it doesn't get any better than that. Let's see what happens. The other thing is I'm running for the first time ever a pretty aggressively cut Oregon chainsaw um, chain on this. I haven't used it before. My two previous chains came directly from Grandberg. At about this point in the log, I would refuel this particular log because as you can see, I've been cutting it down. I would refuel and re-oil. Let's see how that goes. The one thing I'm, I just realized I'm missing and it'll show up in the next segment of the video after we shut it off and restart is some wedges and a hammer. Because as we go down this log, basically in two foot increments, Kyler, who is helping me film this, is going to be driving in a wedge because otherwise it's going to tighten up really significantly on that chain and it's not going to be at all helpful. So I'm going to get, I've got about eight wedges and a little rubber mallet. We're going to pop them in and we'll stop and take a shot of that. Okay, so here we are. You remember what I told you about the compression release, right? Done.
Hey, thanks for being patient with me. I just needed to just let it cool for like all of five seconds before I shut it down. And uh, I'd forgotten to mention, I turned this on full. We've got lots of chain oil going to that end of the chain. We've got lots of chain oil going to this end of the chain. So the initial synopsis is that Granberg versus the Oregon uh, ripping chain not a lot of difference it's progressing at about the same speed hey that's a hell of a lot of wood to cut <laughs> through like you could fall a tree with what we've just done there and we have a few more feet to go so it's going to burn about the same amount of uh, fuel it's going to burn about the same amount of oil but i'm really liking the way it's feeling it's feeling much better than it was with the wrong uh, driver cog on it that's for sure and so I'm not going to bore you with the end or rest of this cut what we're going to do is we're going to peg a uh, uh, a wedge in that end when uh, the saw advances about two more feet we're going to insert uh, some of these as we go down the cut and stay tuned We'll show you the final slab when it comes off the log. Hey, so here's where we landed after all of this. Uh, so here's the slab that we cut and it's pretty sweet. Gonna have to put a couple of bow ties into it. It's pretty awesome. And let's just go back to the mother log. Uh, we've still got 40 inches of width down here. Still too big for the uh, little Norwood HD 36 to accommodate, even if I stand it upright. So I'm going to have to continue slabbing it. And it, just an assessment on the chain, um, the Oregon chain versus the Granberg chain. As I run my hand over this and just kind of feel how it turned out, uh, it's a, definitely a little rougher. I've got a couple of dining room tables or a dining room table and another table in the house that I have. And there's something that's just really authentic when it has uh, that little extra roughness, but I had actually thought I would be more impressed by the smoothness of the Oregon chain and its cut. But uh, regardless, um, not bad. I've got a good source of chain without having to go to Granberg, which means US customs and duties, being I'm in Canada. So I'm a happy guy. And here we are at 82 Maple, still got all eight fingers, two thumbs, and having fun. Let's talk soon.